Very excited for this episode of the Shane Thing Podcast. Former Mets general manager Omar Manaya joins us as a special guest. We have a lot to discuss currently. What is going on with the Mets offensively? What would he do as a general manager to remedy it? Is there anything for a general manager to do? We'll discuss some look back at Jacob DeGrom, a look back at Matt Harvey as well, and we'll talk Lindor and some reminiscing on some Sports Illustrated shoots when he was in the job with the New York Mets. All coming up on the Shanding Podcast. It starts right now. Welcome to the show, everybody. Once again, Shane, I think it's brought to you now by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets from the network more people rely on only on Verizon. Once again, please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, we appreciate it. Uh, the rating and reviewing uh, helps us um, as we try and move forward. And speaking of moving forward, uh, we're very excited to have former Mets general manager Omar Manaya on the podcast this week. And um, Omar's been uh, contributing regularly to Baseball Night New York for the past couple of weeks. Um, and it's been a lot of fun specifically talking about, you know, the players he's scouted. Um, obviously, the team today, too, he's great to, to analyze that with. But guys like Matt Harvey and Jacob deGrom, we'll get to in a little bit. He saw them before we all did. And he has some specific memories of them and kind of how they uh, became the pitchers that they eventually became. And that's really interesting stuff to get into. But first, I know any Met fan listening to this, uh, we're recording this on Thursday afternoon, is uh, annoyed at their team once again, Omar, for not scoring runs for Jacob DeGrom. Now, the team offensively is in a funk. So, yes, it's nothing new that DeGrom pitched well and they didn't score runs for him. But this is a team that I think the fans expected more of offensively. So if you were the GM in a time like this, as I'm sure you were, every team goes through these, what do you do? Is there anything to do when a team is just ice cold offensively? Well, as a general manager, what you do is you let, you know, you communicate with your manager, you communicate with your hitting coaches, because really that's the leadership as far as uh, that is communicating with the players. And you let them know, you know, you supported them. And you try to find out, you know, why is it, is it pitch selection? A lot of times it could be a couple of things. It could be not having the right pitch selection, maybe being too passive, maybe being too aggressive. Um, and as slumps are part of this, it's a long season. It's 162 games. You're going to go through these stretches. Um, you know, a part of it could be that it's been a broken season. As we look at the Mets, you can break out of camp, things are looking good, and then you're off for a while. So nobody could be a timing situation uh, where everything, you know, it's just not clicking at this time. There might be one or two guys that are that are clicking. A lot of the time it has to do a lot with pitch selection and you know what you make you want to make sure is that you the guys are prepared that you know there's a lot of work that's put into the advanced report making sure that that is being discussed that that is being at least analyzed are we getting the right information and are we communicating the right information to the hitters so they can kind of be you know ahead of anticipate what the pitchers are throwing a lot of it has to do with a lot of timing Issues and, and and I said and you know I go back to what I previously said that it was you know it's it, it's a broken early season for the New York Mets right now. So that one thing I want to follow up on though is the preparation. So Jeff McNeil said after the game two days ago that you know we weren't expecting to see um, as many breaking balls as we did. Something like that, like. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it was word for word, but it basically, he was saying that the uh, preparation we did on paper, maybe on video as well, was different from what we were seeing mid game. So is there such thing as over preparation? Because there's a lot of good pitchers out there right now. That's the story of baseball. Um, is there a possibility that we're not watching the, on the field enough and we're over preparing these days to try and, and study a pitcher before you actually face him, become an expert when you, you really just need to be in the box to be able to do that? Well, I think your word is over-preparation. I, look, I believe in a lot of preparation. So I, I believe preparation is great. You know, the balance of preparation, that can be discussed. Uh, I think what you want to see when, you, when a player says that is, you know, you want to kind of 
let's make sure that the information that we are getting, if, you, if the player says that, they, you know, they, we, we were not expecting these pitches, well, you know, I want to make sure what, you know, what was the information I was getting, why was the information. Now, we are living in a wonderful world of uh, tracking data, so we're very um, – the ability to track what tendencies are visually and also from a uh, from a from a scanner report, we're in a great spot as an industry to do that right now. Uh, but also, teams are also going to be able to pitch guys different, so it's making adjustments too along the way. Uh, so that being said, uh, that's a very great comment to analyze and study why McNeil Jeff McNeil said that feels that. And where is the quote unquote? Why is why why is there not a connection with what what, what he was expecting to to you know the pitches the pitches that he was expecting? Why why is the why is there a disconnect? You know, those are the kind of things in the front office that you sit down and you discuss with the player, or you not so much you discuss maybe with the manager, the hitting coach, and the whole of uh, scouting um, the uh, the advanced scouting uh, group of, of of the staff. Yeah. I- it fascinates me just how much these players know going into a game. And uh, if a pitcher decides, Hey, I'm going to pitch these guys totally differently than I pitched five days ago in my last start, that probably is a, an advantage for that pitcher because he knows they're preparing off of his last start. Um, so I'm sure that goes into the mind games of everything right now. But again, um, this is a Mets team right now that just isn't hitting collectively. Uh, it seems like it continues to snowball. We're going to get into uh, Francisco Lindor specifically in just a bit. Um, but first, uh, let's do a three batter rule. And Omar, this is just when we uh, we just pick three players to talk about. And um, I, I, I want to start with Jacob deGrom because the level of greatness is, is at a level that we have not yet seen from a guy who's won um, two Cy Youngs. So that's saying something in and of itself. Um, but I'm just curious, Omar, because I was thinking last night, and I know Jeff, our producer, feels the same way because I got a long rant of an email from him. Um, if Jacob deGrom said tomorrow, like, I'd like to be traded, I would not blame him. Like, I, 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 it would make total sense to me. He just hasn't gotten the support. It's got to be frustrating for him. And I know he's gotten the accolades without the wins. So he's fine. He's made the money. He's doing fine but it's just got away on him after a while. And I know you know him personally. Don't you think that the frustration starts to mount when you're so great and yet you don't see anything in the wind column that represents that? Well, listen, I I think uh, he's such a competitor and what makes him great is his focus on being perfect or perfection for himself. You know, so he's focused on getting, doing his job. That's Jacob DeGrom. Now, understand this, that in doing this job, you want to win games. And we've seen this here. You know, he reminds me a lot of what Tom Siva went through over the years. I grew up watching Tom Siva, and Tom Siva did not get a lot of run support. In a lot of ways, sometimes, you know, and it's, it, 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 there's do you, you feel frustrated because it's almost like you feel like, God, if we can score three or four runs, you know, this game is over, you know, and <laughs> it's not there. Uh, the runs are going to be there. Um, yes, if you look at the body of work, I mean, think about how many more wins he could have had if he gets run support the past couple of years, three or four years. And that is kind of when you when you reflect back, you say, wow, man, this guy could have won 20 games, you know, in the past couple of years. I can't speak for Jacob. I just know that what he's focused on is I got to do my job. I got to I got to execute. I got to make pitches. And the amazing thing and the, the greatness of him is even like a game like yesterday, here we are watching the game and we think he wasn't all that great yesterday because mm-hmm. the outing before was so unbelievable. And I'm texting my friends and I'm saying, oh, he missed a pitch here. Oh, he missed like yesterday. He was missing more. There were falling balls off. And we're talking about probably the best hit one of, uh, uh, today, one of the better, better hitting teams in baseball, the, the, the Boston Red Sox. I think he struck out eight. He only gave up, I think, three hits or maybe more. I don't know. But it was like, in most for most pitchers, that is like such a dominant outing for Jacob DeGrom. It's like, oh, he, he was off yesterday. And, and, and I say this on the offensive side for him, I, I mean, he's just such a competitor. I, I, don't, I don't think he feels that, but 
I think I would be feeling a little bit like yeah. that. But <laughs> Maybe that's part, that's part of what makes him superhuman is that he somehow doesn't feel it. And that says a lot about how he's wired six innings, three hits, one earned run, one walk, nine strikeouts. And when he walked that batter late in his start, it was like, Whoa, I, I, it was so weird to see. And you could tell he pointed, you know, every pitcher after they get a runner on first base with less than two outs points at the shortstop or the second baseman to see who's his guy for a stolen base or, you know, uh, you know, just to check in with the middle infield. And he did that. He looked rusty. He pointed at Lindor and McNeil. Like, I think this is what you do when you allow a base runner. So speaking of not necessarily how DeGrom's wired, but we had a really interesting conversation about him on Baseball Night in New York the other night in which it occurred to me, Omar, that um, we talk about him so often as having less tread on the tire as most 32, 33-year-old pitchers because he was an athlete, a shortstop at Stetson, et cetera, um, and didn't have that mileage on his arm that most pitchers do at his age. In large part, you're to credit for that because you were describing the process of scouting him, knowing that fact about him, that like when you take a pitcher who is an athlete at the same time, it's a greater chance that he pitches later and deeper into his career. Can you tell us a little bit about what you thought of him when you first saw him and just how far he's grown from that time to now? Well, really, I, I saw him very limited. We only had, I didn't see him live, you know, because he was a ninth round pick. Um, so as a general manager, you really don't get to see him. And really, we only had like, I believe, one report on him. Uh, it was more a visual look that we had on him. You know, we saw him uh, on, on on video. And I remember, you know, talking about a young, well, talking about an athletic shortstop that had a real good loose arm uh, and, and had that kind of body. I mean, this... I think the success for that is really the philosophy that we had in the organization. That's really the winner. We believe in, in the philosophy of athletes and the Grom just happened to be the athlete that we chose, chose and to credit to the area scouts and supervisors and the directors. And it's, it's an organization, it's an organizational credit, but also I believe that it was, uh, you know, it was the, a, a development of, uh, story that because he had to be developed. Remember he had Tommy John from, from, so from the get-go, but the development people did a great job in developing. But the philosophy was always, we are going to take the best athlete. And it was close between two guys who were taking the athlete. And that one, and I feel good about the philosophy of the organization at the time, that we felt like this is this is how we do things. When, and it was, you know, and he's a proven of that philosophy. Credit to all the guys that, that were there. Uh, but when I saw him, all I saw was a lanky, loose, athletic guy in the room talking about it. As a general manager, I'm there listening because I'm giving all the leeway to the area scouts, cross checkers, and the scouting director, the leeway to make the pick. Myself, I'm the general manager. You know, I'm, I'm the idea guy. I'm the one that brings in and makes sure that the idea the, that we are, our philosophy is being, is on track. And that's how we ended up with Jacob DeGrom. It's an organization decision. Yeah. And, and by the way, every aspect, it's not just the fact that he's great and somehow getting better. It's that he's been the hitter that he is. He fields his position so well. Like there's so many positives of having an athlete on the mound like Jacob deGrom. Uh, and to your point, it's one thing to say, here's why we drafted him. It's another thing for you to describe how he went from the lanky shortstop that you thought had a good arm. And that's really all you saw was some video. And that was enough in the ninth round to eventually him getting called up to make that start against the Yankees. And even though he wasn't this big name prospect, clearly somebody in the organization um, saw progression. So as soon as he came in, Omar, like, was he a guy who was talked about a lot as somebody who's improving and we might have something here? Well, well, first of all, remember, we drafted him in 2010. Uh, that was my last year as general manager. So I can only speak to what I heard because I was not, I, I, I went from the Mets to the Padres. So I was not there doing his minor, minor league career. Now, I have, you know, being, being back with the Mets, always checking in and always, always paying attention because a lot of the employees there were guys that I had hired. And, yeah, you know, there was a moment where people didn't, but then I think he really, Two years, a year after his um, his Tommy John, I think, you know, right, right about when he was about getting to double A, 
uh, I think he pitched in uh, Florida State. He started off, I believe, he started off in the South Atlantic League, and then he went to uh, Florida State, right between uh, Florida State and Double A. Yeah, then then things started things started really standing out. You know, his name started being rumored. And I bet you, if you look at all those top hundreds, you know, um, prospects, he was not in one of those top hundred prospects. <laughs> but that's a credit to the staff, the people that were developing him. You know, that was a credit to Phil Reagan, a credit to Guy Connie. I got a credit to those coaches that were, you know, working with him and helping him out. And then, um, and I may be missing other names of coaches that probably, you know, were there. So I'm just naming coaches that I know you know, very veteran coaches, good coaches that were patient. And I know coaches that he felt helped them in my conversation with, like, with him over the years, I mean, coaches that he liked. So that being said, his name was a name, but it, it really, I, I personally, when I, when I really first saw, said, this guy is a guy. I said like, wow, it was in the all-star game in, in, um, in Cincinnati, I believe it was in 2015. I think it was. Yeah. And that he, was a insane inning. I remember and that. that I was there. And it reminded me a lot of Pedro Martinez all-star inning, I believe, in 2099, uh, 1999. I mean, it was total dominance. And we're talking about when you start dominating guys in an all-star game, not, that's, pretty, that's, that's pretty, pretty good, you know? <laughs> so that's the development that I – and what I've seen of, of Jacob DeGrom once he was signed. And I saw some of it. I saw it from a distance. Some of you, know, but it's a credit to those people that were there developing him. Yeah, it was a good point that you made that that you left and went to San Diego uh, and didn't, you know, watch from from the Mets' perspective his ascension through the the minors. However, I ask in part because there's got to be a part of you that is still attached to the guys that you choose to bring into an organization, even if you're no longer with that organization. And I, I know that after even you left and worked with the organization before you came back, we used to have these conversations even on the air where we'd be like, look, the guys are piling up that we, we owe Omar the credit to, like, even though he's not there. And I'm not just saying this because we're talking to you now, but even though he's not there anymore. And again, before you returned to the organization, it was like, GMs are a fascinating profession to analyze because a lot of times the players that they worked hard to bring into the organization, the credit that they deserve comes after they're gone um, because it's a hard job to keep for over a decade. So when you draft somebody, you know, six or seven years before they make a real mark at the big league level, a lot of times the guy who deserves the credit for that isn't in the job anymore. So that was the case with you. And I, I was curious as to know, how closely you were keeping track of it. But I love that the first time you were like, wow, uh, look at what this guy's doing is at the all-star game. Cause I think that that was a league wide thing. I remember Joe Buck was doing the play-by-play -play for that. It was like, it was almost like it, his radar was the first time that Jacob DeGrom appeared on that. And at a national stage, I think that meant a lot to, to DeGrom. I remember talking to him after it and talking about the radar gun, like, man, I've never seen a hundred out of you. And that was really the start of that, uh, triple digits on the gun. Um, another guy that we talked to second of the three batter rule here, uh, Omar, Matt Harvey, we talked about that on baseball night, New York. And I think Mets fans are a combination of uh, there's some eye rolling when we bring them up on the shows, because it's like, this guy isn't on our team anymore. Why do we keep talking about him? And there's also some understanding because of just how much he meant uh, feels like yesterday, but 2013, the, the all-star game that year, the, his first half, the 2015 World Series. There's a lot of memories for Mets fans to reminisce on with him. Um, you, though, not only obviously uh, scouted him when he was young and you talked about uh, North Carolina and everything and how he looked then, but also scouted him before the 2020 season. Um, or you scouted him in 2020 before the 2021. Like, what was the timeline? Tell us when the last time you saw him pitch was, when you scouted him, and what you recommended to the Mets after you saw him pitch. Well, you mean recently, of course. Yes, um, yeah. In 2020, as you know, uh, he, he was pitching for um, Kansas City, um, you know, and, you know, he was – I always – back to you said earlier, I always stay in contact or always keep an eye on guys that you've been involved with. There's no doubt. I mean, to this day, you know – First guy that we signed when I was with the match was Nelson Cruz. And I still, to this day, I'm following Nelson Cruz. 
after all these years. You know, he was the first player that we signed when I was with the Mets in 1998, I believe it was. So, to, and so Harvey, of course, you stay in contact with him and you follow him and you know that. I mean, of course, it's, I've seen the journey from North Carolina to drafting him because that year, we, you know, when the, the year 2010 in that draft, yes, you know, we got to the ninth round and we drafted the ground, but the real focus was the first round. And that one I had to see was Harvey, which is number one. So that one had to, that was when I, you know, put a lot of investment in time physically seeing him. So you stay in contact with these guys. And last year was a year, of course, you know, with COVID and everything that was going on. And you saw how it was last year without pitching, you know, with Syndergaard went down. The next thing you know, Stroman went down and, um, you know, Batances was hard. We had a lot of injuries in our pitching last year. And it just so happened that Harvey was out there as really. And, you know, <clears throat> Brody basically either, I don't know how we got to, the bottom line got to, there was interest in him. And I said, hey, I want to go see him because I have history with him. And I, you know, I, it, we kept it quiet because let's, you know, it's a name, like you says, when you bring up Harvey, there's a lot of history there. There's a lot of, you know, the dark night. There's a lot of, you know, passion, good and bad. What a better, but overall, probably more good than bad. Uh, because in the end, he brought her, he gave a lot of joy to a lot of Metro, you know, a yep. lot of joy. And he was, he was dominant. I mean, he was an all-star. He was at all these things and, you know, but because of, the sensitivity of putting it out there. I, I basically went to see him in Connecticut. Um, it was a private session, just myself. And I believe Bryn Alderson was with me at the time. And we went and we saw him and I scouted him. And, you know, and of course, the thing about Harvey is and not only Harvey, a lot of these guys, you know, people try to go back and, and is he the same that he used to be? Well, of course he's not the same that he used to be. <laughs> if he was the same that he used to be, you won't be trying, you won't be seeing him here. But can he get back to where he used to be? And, and I'm one of those that I always give the player the benefit of the doubt, you know. So I did have interest in signing him. There's no doubt. You know, I I felt I will tell you this, he's starting now. I thought last year he was more of a reliever than he was a starter at the time. I thought with COVID, the way the year, the shortness, understanding that it wasn't a minor league season. It was more kind of a alternate site. So you're able to kind of pitch. So it's not, I, you know, I felt he can be a reliever. I always see that, you know, I think that even whenever his starting days are over, I always still feel that he can, you know, he has that attack mentality. The good thing I like to see about him now is, of course, where he is different than he was when I saw him last uh, August, might have been, or last July is that now, he, you know, he's, he's commanding his pitches much better. You know, he, he wasn't commanding his pitches that, that that last summer the way he is now. And I think he's got his confidence back. You know, I know that. And I'm, of course, rooting for him because we always root for our guys. We always root for, for especially guys that, you know, in the Mets family, you're, we're always rooting for you. And he, his pitches are sharper. His secondary pitches, and he's come up with a changeup. So that's the difference where he is today. Was I interested in signing him? Yes. Did I think he was a starter last year? No, I thought he was more relieved. Um, but it, it didn't happen. But it was more kind of, you know, timing of the situation just didn't work. I I, I love um, the point that you made where it's like, can he be the guy he used to be? It's like, well, I probably wouldn't be at a private session in Connecticut, wondering if I should sign this guy to be a reliever if he was the Matt Harvey of old. If he was the Matt Harvey of old, he'd be at, at, at a, in the middle of a $240 million contract with some other team or with the Mets. Um, so, I mean, look, endlessly fascinated by him and his career personally. Um, and I I don't know. I, I, I love the idea of you recommending to the organization, hey, I think this would be an interesting guy to sign. And I, as a talk show host in New York, Omar, to be totally honest with you, if you had ended up signing him, the storyline would have been the Mets are taking a flyer on him to see if he can reclaim what he used to be. Uh, I'm sure they're doing it to sell tickets. You know, they, it's the storyline. They want the back page. That is doing such a disservice to you and Bryn Alderson at this, at this private session watching closely what this guy is on the mound. That's really what it would have been. Am I right, Omar? Like you were scouting a pitcher. His name happened to be Matt Harvey. And if you're, uh, if you're going back to the organization and saying, 
we should sign this guy. It's because you think he can get outs and it's not about anything other than that. Well, that's ideally that's the way it should be, <laughs> but that's just not the way it is sometimes. And I get it, you know, and don't get me wrong. I'd say, you know, I, 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 I says, I, the question is, and I've been as when you're, when you make these decisions, you got to say, okay, is it worth, is it worth the risk? Because when you take on players that are, you know, and I use the word popular or bring attention, is it worth the value? And I said to you, listen, I'm not telling you that I thought he was great. I'm telling you, I thought he was a reliever. Not that, you know, it wasn't that I said, this is, we got to get this guy. So I was more like this guy, is he worth a chance? Yes. As a reliever, I didn't think he was going to be a guy that was going to be, I'm happy that what he is today. I mean, I didn't think he was a starter back then, but, mm -hmm. and then you say to yourself where you are, where you are in the season, how long is it going to take and who is he going to replace? And then there is, there's no doubt when you bring on a player like that, there's a, there's a PR component to this and you have to add, add, add all those things together and say, it's a worth, it's a worth, and it's a worth for, for Matt also. It's a worth to put him in that spot. All those things have to be considered, not only you as an organization, but for him also, you know, put him in that spot. And, you know, at the time, I think, you know, we, we, and I used the word, you know, the decision was done that we said, Hey, look, let's just, let's just, let's not take, let's not take this path. Right. You know, and, but in the end, what I'm happy for that he's doing well, very happy for him. And I'm hoping that he continues to do well because I do believe that, you know, he's young enough. I mean, I think Matt is 31, 32. That's not all for a pitcher, you know? It's not all for a pitcher. Um, and I'm just happy that his velocity is even better. Command velocity, he's got the it to go get it. And then the secondary pick. So I'm hoping real good things for him. Yeah, and, and maybe Baltimore was the perfect place for him, to your point. Um, once again, you're listening to the Shane Anything Podcast. It's brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets. From the network, more people rely on only on Verizon. All right, back to the 2021 team, Omar. Um, Francisco Lindor, uh, he heard the the city field boo birds for the first time the other night. He was asked about it yesterday. His his response was, you know, it's funny, it, it sucks. Uh, it, you know, he was very human about it and, and uh, did it with a smile on his face uh, like he does everything. You saw Carlos Beltran struggle and, and kind of his adjustment to New York, new league, new team. Um, do you think that's all that's happening here? Um, or do you think it's possible that it's that combined with, you know, maybe some uh, mechanical issues at the plate for him? Well, I think, I, I mean, I'm being in New York for so many years, being watching how new free agents come in here. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of time for them to kind of adjust. Very similar. I think you're, you're at your evaluation of the, Beltran and Lindor are very, very similar. You know, they both come from Central American, Central American League teams. They're both similar age. They're both Puerto Rican players. There's all, they both play in the middle of the field. Beltran made adjustments. His first year, it took some time for him to adjust. Uh, and I think Lindor is going to adjust also. But, you know, uh, are there mechanical issues? There's, there's, like anything, there's always going to be, so, you know, there might be some mechanical issues there. That, But I think when it's not the first time that players come, they, 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 they trade it, they come to New York. Um, and it's, it's a different, it's a different league, a different city, a major city. A lot of things are more pay attention to than other places. Uh, but I think for love this school, the door is going to be fine. I just think that all these little combinations of things of timing of league changes, uh, you know, they will, it will work out. It's going to work out. It's just going to take like anything else, like the Beltran, the Beltran, I thought the Beltran was probably, when you look at his history of what he did and how well he played beyond, he did very well. And it's going to work out for Lindor. You know, there's, uh, I've talked about this kind of the confidence that Lindor has in himself. We talked about it on the podcast with Andy last week. Um, you know, th that goes to show you how important it is to have success in the big leagues. And that's obviously how he got his contract. But the fact that he can say, yeah, I made an error won't happen again. Or he said yesterday, the numbers will come. That type of um, self-confidence is so important. I think for Mets fans to hear if he was like, yeah, I, you know, I don't know what's going on. And he seemed really dejected and lost. Um, that would be worrisome, but I, I tend to agree. I mean, this is a guy who's had so much sustained success in the big leagues 
Um, and he has the, the track record to be able to say, I'm just in a rut right now. I feel okay. Um, the numbers will be there. Um, all right. So one, one okay. thing that's important on this point too is that he's facing the media. And I think it's important that he's honest and say, hey, look, you know, and he has great personality and he's able to communicate that. You know, I would be concerned if he was not talking to the media about it. I would be concerned if he's hiding. That would be scary for me. He's not doing that. He's, he's, he say, hey, look, I, you know, I'm not doing this and that and I'm going to be OK. And to me, that, that's the biggest challenge for me when players come to New York. When things don't go bad, you go out there. Talk to, you know, accept whatever you're saying, but talk to the media. Don't be, don't try to um, uh, hide. Don't try to, don't do those kind of things, no. Yeah. Um, so speaking of, of the media, let's reminisce a little bit back to 06, 07. Um, our producer, Jeff, loves these Sports Illustrated covers. We did an episode of Like We Never Left um, with the 06 Mets where we, talked about the Captain Red-Ass Paul LaDuca um, cover shot. And that led to some some great conversation. By the way, shameless plug, you can still check out that episode of Like We Never Left on SNY.TV. Um, the, the cover was with LaDuca, of course, David Wright, Carlos Delgado, Carlos Beltran, Jose Reyes. When you think of that crew, when you think of that cover, what comes to mind? Well, it's a fun time for the Mets. It comes to mind to me is... Uh, Shea Stadium, uh, it comes to mind, a, a team that was uh, a season that was all coming together. Everybody was having fun. Uh, I think comes to mind is a group of uh, a young David, a young Jose, energy. Um, it comes to mind, uh, uh, a Beltran and a Delgado and, and the Laduca, guys that I think the whole city connected to. Everybody can mm-hmm. see themselves in a certain way. Somebody, you know, you play softball, you saw yourself as that power hitter, that Delgado. It's the same way it is a little bit with Pete right now. You know, you you play, that's, that's my guy. And if you, you know, then you can raise the quickness, the twitch. And then David Wright, the, the, that, the, the golden kid, the, go, the good-looking young kid, you know. Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, you got Beltran, the Swift, and then you got, you know, all those kind of guys. It was, you, everybody can connect. I mean, you're a New Yorker, and we're, Willie's from Brooklyn, the general manager's from Queens. That's what I think of that, that, that feeling. And above all, I think of Shea Stadium. You know, growing up, growing up next to Shea Stadium, it was a place and it was an exciting time. And it was an exciting time. To, and of course, because we remember we, we, when in, from 2004 to 2005, the signing, the buildup, all the excitement, it all worked together. And at the time, you know, it was the beginning. Of, I believe it was the beginning of SNY. So SNY was is a was a baby at the time, and it was all, a lot of new things coming together, a lot of diversity coming together. Yeah, I, I love your point that it, you know New Yorkers saw themselves in that group. And I was thinking as you were talking, it's like, and if you happen to love betting on horses, you see yourself in Paul Laduca. Uh, there's there was just kind of like. Uh, relatability with that group and they also happen to be great um so uh, that was so much fun to talk to them about now 07 sports illustrated comes calling again this one's a little more personal to you you're on the cover willie randolph andy chavez um uh, oliver perez el duque john main's kind of in the corner (laughs) like what am i doing here um, but it was a lot about your journey to become the first Hispanic general manager in the big leagues. Was that really a notable moment for you to, to be on that cover and to have somebody asking those questions? Oh, no doubt. Well, first of all, the guy who, the guy who wrote it, um, Gary Smith, I believe it is. I mean, this, this guy's legendary. You know, when I was told that Gary Smith was Gary, if I'm not mistaken, he only wrote two or three stories a year. And we're still friends, you know, I mean, just became friends. Gary was, and, and when they say Gary Smith, so how what Gary does is he lives with you for about four or five days for a week. I mean, lives, actually lives with you. And and I felt came, you know, comfortable giving him um, access to myself. Jay Horowitz, of course, the PR director, was who was great, you know, one of the best PR directors in the history, in the game for me. I love the guy. You know, he was the one that said, yeah, this is something worth doing and, and allowing it to you into your home, into your family. But this hit this back to the 2006 group, what this was, this was a kind of everything that we talked about before. How did this, how did that come together? 
from 2004 to 2000, then we get five, six, seven. And of course, remember, we went from about, I mean, those years we was 3. Point, I believe 3.5, uh, 3.5 uh, million fans, 3.7 million fans, 4 million fans. It was, it was the place to be. And it was, SNY was, so, but the thing was, it was more, like I say, a little bit about the philosophy of it all. For me, it was drawn up. I'm big on drawing things up and seeing philosophy. Seeing, you know, we talked about the ground philosophy. What won? It wasn't the sky. It was, it was the philosophy, that I believe, that won with the ground. We believed in our philosophy. The concept here was diversity. The concept here was SNY. The concept here was we're going to make this feeling uh, about, a, a, about New York. We're going to, you know, Willie Randall was a queen, you know, Brooklyn guy. We, you know, ownership is, is local ownership, you know. The ownership was, you know, raised in Brooklyn, you know, uh, uh, general manager, the players, you know, we kind of, we wanted to blend in, you know, this whole metropolis, this whole, and that's what the, the, the article was about. And Gary did a good job at how, how does this, how did this come together and how did this fit in this great metropolis? And of course, as a person from Queens, you know, to me, Queens is like the greatest place in the world. Because there's no more diverse place in the world than Queens. There's, I don't care where you go. You can, I don't know anywhere in the world where you can take, uh, you know, when you square miles of diversity, mm-hmm. seven. That's what was fun about it for me. And Gary did a great job in putting that. And the one thing that, uh, great to your point, John Main was there. There was another guy there, but he got cut off. And people don't know that. The guy who was below was Joe Smith. I don't know if you remember Joe Smith. Wow, yeah, he's, so, he's still pitching. Yeah, Joe Smith, of course, back as a kid that we drafted. We drafted him in the third round. He was in the major league the next year. You know what I'm saying? So uh, Joe Smith was at the bottom, but the photographer cut him off. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> you know, we wanted a blend of everybody. So we had the young kid from Ohio, college pitcher, and Joe Smith, but the, the photographer cut him off <laughs> of the cover. Poor Joe Smith, but he's had a long, successful career, so we won't feel great too bad for him. Other guys, we, we stay in contact. We follow those guys. We root for them, and Joe Smith, we're rooting for him. Uh, that was a good draft by uh, our, our scout and, and our philosophy. Great athlete. Joe Smith was an unbelievable athlete from underneath, but he was an athletic pitcher. Man, I to your point about Queens, this is just a side note. I – uh, I've always loved um, Anthony Bourdain's show, May He Rest in Peace, but he did this uh, episode in Queens uh, for CNN in Parts Unknown. And it's all about that, how there, there is a different um, ethnicity and type of food that you can get every block you go. And it's such a unique neighborhood in that way. And I thought he did a great job of telling that story. And I also think that um, from listening to you, the organizational philosophy that you put in place is the thing that you get the most pride from. Um, and in talking to just the draft of Jacob deGrom, such a good symbol of that because you weren't there watching him in person, but you're relying on the people that you've hired beneath you to make the right decisions. And it seems like right. that's still the main thing that you look back on with pride in your role as the general manager. I looked at with pride. I looked at her pride right now of being in the organization as an ambassador. I'm an ambassador for the organization because I believe in this organization. I've been with this organization for so many years. I grew up with this organization just as a kid. So, but we stand out different. You know, listen, I, we, I give credit. I'm not one of those Yankee haters. You know, I'm not that because I love New York. I'm a New Yorker. Uh, so I'm not, but I am so proud of what we are, the, 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 the Met, the Metropolitan, the team from Queen. The National League team, all those things. So my job as an ambassador now is to really continue to make sure that that's what we stand for. You know, we stand for this diversity. And anytime we can, if I can be of help in bringing that about and connecting that, to me, that's huge. And that's what I love uh, to do in my job because I think it's, we have we have a rich tradition um, being Met fans, being from Queens and so if I'm an ambassador for the Mets, I'm an ambassador for Queens. I'm an ambassador for New York. I just believe in, because that's what I was raised with, and that's what I believe in. Yeah, the Mets organization has been smart to, to say and act on the idea that you are the, the borough that you play in. And, you know, they say it, Queens is one of the most diverse places in the country. 
And uh, as an organization, they owe it to the borough that hosts them and their hometown to accurately represent where they play. Um, Omar, um, this has been such a pleasure. We really appreciate going through um, some of the, the times when you were the general manager, now that you're an ambassador, and also uh, hear your thoughts on the current team, some of the struggles that they're having. I know it's been a real treat for any Met fan listening. Um, so thank you for joining us. And a reminder to anyone listening, uh, subscribe to the Shannon Podcast wherever you get your podcast. We appreciate it. Even if you just downloaded this episode, if you subscribe and you get each episode, it means a lot to us. And it's brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets from the network. More people will rely on only on Verizon. Omar, thank you. We'll see you soon on Baseball Night in New York. Great talking to you.